While I make every effort to broadcast correct information, I'm also still learning. I will double check all my facts, but realize that healthcare is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or healthcare provider may have a different way of doing things from another. I welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. I take no money from supplement or device companies. By listening to this podcast or reading this blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice or to treat any medical condition, neither yourself or others including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your healthcare provider for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast or the website. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or blog or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Boss Body podcast be responsible for damages arising from use of the podcast or the blog. This blog or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limiting to, limited to establishing the standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or the blog. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Boss Body Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Jackson, DPT, and I have another very special guest with us today. Dr. Sheila Kilbane. Dr. Sheila Kilbane, MD, is a board-certified pediatrician who trained in integrative medicine with Dr. Andrew Weil, MD, and is a best-selling author. She uses the best of conventional and integrative medicine to identify and treat the root causes of children's illnesses. Her goal is to help children reach optimal health so that they can thrive. Using her seven-step process along with natural and nutritional therapies, Dr. Kilbane helps significantly improve or resolve Altogether, childhood issues such as colic, reflux, eczema, recurrent ear and sinus infections, asthma, allergies, constipation, or loose stools, and other GI issues such as abdominal pain. She is also the author of the book, Happy Kids, Happy Moms, Seven Steps to Heal and Prevent Common Childhood Illnesses, which was released in September of 2021. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kilbane. Thank you. Thank you. And it, the, it's healthy kids, happy moms. Just if, if people are looking for the. Oh, looking. sorry. Yeah. It's no, happy, no worries. Happy kids, yeah, happy thank, moms. Yes. Thank you for having me. And I know the amount of work it takes to do these. So I just want to make sure your listeners appreciate all, all the work that goes into even creating, recording. There's a lot behind the scenes. So thank you, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll jump right in and talk about some statistics that are pretty staggering. We know that chronic illnesses and chronic health challenges are on the rise, but you shared with me before we started recording that one in two or 50% of kids have a chronic health condition. Can you talk about that? Yeah, really over the course of my career, I have seen the chronic illnesses just skyrocket. And if you ask any pediatrician now, and you know, in in general, we're just we we are living longer, absolutely. We are just we're getting more sick. And especially we have lots of kids that we see with gut issues, constipation, abdominal pain, eczema, asthma. And they just seem to be getting more serious and it's taking a lot more to keep them under control. So that's the part of what drives me to do what I do was, was as a result of kind of necessity is I was doing, when I first got out of residency, I was doing all the things that I was trained to do, but these kids were they would be back in the office each month because the medications will work for a period of time, but then that inflammation comes back up, another infection returns. And so there's just, there's the integrative medical toolbox, right? When we use the best of conventional and of integrative medicine, it's so powerful and it enlists the innate healing properties of our body. And we just get to see these really incredible results that are long lasting, Absolutely. which I know you've seen through your whole career as well. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely people come, you know, to us sicker now than ever before. And unfortunately, patients and, you know, our parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system, the tone of that nervous system has gone down. So people want results even faster, but they have more and more issues. And we have to try to, you know, get them winning out of the gate. So it's more challenging from a clinical standpoint to get people to be compliant. Do you see that as well? We were very structured in the way that we approach this. So we make one change at a time and we're, we're very, um, especially with kids, you know, we'll do each thing that we're doing. So we tr really try to change one variable at a time. And because people are seeking us out, they've often seen several other practitioners is we, we get great compliance because they're, they have a pretty big pain point, you know, and it's different in the pediatric world versus the adult world, because the adults are going to create the situation for these changes to happen. And there's a, there's a big motivation. So we, we generally in the practice get great compliance. It's my book, you know, that is for the, the general public that it, that can be a little bit trickier when you're you know out reading and being in the world where there's junk food around every corner or the kids are getting rewarded in school with you know with with treats and sweets and things like that and it's extremely doable and that's why right we know with habit changing habits you do one small thing at a time and so that's where in my book, I outline, right? We just start with something really simple called the, the mini cleanse for kids. Um, but that, that's a very long answer to a short question, but it's, um, it's doable. So I want people to leave this podcast knowing that they can do it. You can, you can make small changes and over time, it will, that's where you see the, the huge transformations. Absolutely. And do you get people who come to you who are trying to conceive and they want to just sort of plan ahead and want to know how they can get healthier so that their child is healthier? We, 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 because we, I see kids, we definitely are talking to the parents about that. And especially if they are going to have their second child or third child, we talk about cleaning up the diets of the moms and the dads. And both of my nieces just had babies. And so we worked, we started a year ahead of time and started cleaning up what they were eating. You know, and there's some great studies that really show if you are using clean products. So like, what do we mean by that? Right. I always talk, I, I, break it down into the air that we breathe, right? So we breathe about 10,000 liters of air a day. So you want to make sure you've got clean air in your home that you're breathing. You can't control what's outside, but clean air, clean water, we drink anywhere from a liter to three liters of water a day. So we want good filtered water and food. We want to have organic whenever possible, pesticide-free food, we eat three meals a day, right? Snacks. So really looking at things in that realm and then talking about, right, the lotions that you use, makeup, shampoo. You know, there's a stat that women use, I think it's 15 different products before we leave the house every day. Yeah. And it's, I, I heard that and I thought, oh, no way, but we do. And if you're not looking at the ingredients, most likely there are ingredients that are carcinogenic. And we know that those things pass through the umbilical cord. So it's really important if you're thinking about getting pregnant for mom and dad to start being cog cognizant of what, what you're eating, breathing, drinking, and putting on your body. Absolutely. I read a study, I think it was six, maybe seven years ago, and they did um, a survey of nine different U.S. cities and the average uh, tap water uh, in each city had around nine medications. And they said that in the same study, the number of toxicants in the umbilical cord, uh, that it contained between 250 to 300 known carcinogens. 
Absolutely. It's the, the 10 human study, right, by the Environmental Working Group. And it we before that study, we thought that the placenta filtered those things out. So we know that it doesn't. And it's in some of the there were about 30 different things that were found in the cord blood, right? So before the baby ever steps foot on this earth, that had been banned 30 years prior to the study. Right. So what does that mean is that it's gotten into our groundwater and they're, they're not just like the, the study that you're talking about with the water supply is we're not testing the water for all these other things. Right. Our, our city is testing the water for bacteria, parasites, things like that, but not for prescription medications. Right. Absolutely. And so I think there's this misconception that, you know, babies kind of start out on this planet um, with a clean slate, no toxins, but that's simply not true. So obviously, you know, if um, mom's breastfeeding, you don't want to have mom start detoxing. But what is the earliest that you can start gently supporting the detoxification pathways? Yes, and this is what I love about kids because their systems regulate so quickly. And the first thing, if you are a, if you're a mom who maybe you had to have a C-section, is we start right then. If the baby is breastfeeding, the mom can take a probiotic, and if the baby is bottle feeding, you can put the probiotic. You can either put it in the bottle, or you can just rub it right on the baby's gums, and so we start right from the get-go and that's all. And then just being being conscious of what mom is drinking and eating and then, and even, you know, cleaning products and things like that. So it's, you just by eating clean foods and products is you've already begun the process. So there's not a lot, right? Babies aren't gonna, we're not gonna be giving a lot of things to babies. The, the most that we ever do with supplements for babies, right? It's vitamin D, a probiotic and digestive enzymes. And if the baby is great and it was a vaginal birth and mom's breastfeeding and things are going great, all I would do is have mom take a probiotic and a digestive enzyme. And then it would, would only add them for the baby if the baby was having any kind of issues. Absolutely. So that's a great answer. Um, a very thorough. I think our listeners will appreciate that. Can we talk a little bit about inflammation? You know, we talk about it as being the root cause of most illnesses and health challenges, but what are the underlying triggers, the most common triggers of that inflammation? Yeah. So the way that, and before I actually go into that, I just want to let your listeners know that we have, we have lots of free resources on the website and we have a supplement guide that goes through some of the things that we just talked about. And it's, if you go to just SheilaKilbane.com forward slash supplement guide, you can get a free download and of exactly how to do that with, with any age with kids or adults. So Moving on to inflammation, the way that I lay it, lay it out. Well, first of all, let me say this is how do you know when you have inflammation and it's I, you and I can see these kids or adults from a mile away, right? They've got dark circles under their eyes. They may be mouth breathing. They may have bumps on the back of their arms, their cheeks, and they'll also have recurrent illnesses. They may have uh, abdominal pain or discomfort, bloating, gassiness, chronic runny nose, asthma, allergies. And so those are the, the clinical manifestations of inflammation. And we know that inflammation is illness. And what we do in conventional medicine is we learn things in a pretty disjointed way, right? We look at the heart, we look at the skin, we look at the ears, the nose, and we assign diagnosis codes to things. And the the, our, the famous saying of Zeb Allen, the pharmacist in our office, is that we write diagnosis codes in pencil. And because a lot of the illnesses are, are descriptions of inflammation, in integrative and functional medicine, we learn to look at things on the, that continuum. And we don't have fences in the body. 
So inflammation in one area is inflammation in other areas. It's often why you might see a child who has eczema and asthma, and then they also have constipation. So it's the top, I, I break it down into those main illnesses, reflux, eczema, recurrent ear and sinus infections, chronic runny nose, allergies, asthma, abdominal pain, constipation. And there are five main triggers of inflammation. And I'm going to share my screen. So for those of you who are watching this on video, you will be able to see these are images from my book. And my, you can get my book anywhere books are sold. And then this is the, the companion workbook, but the images are in the book as well. And we talk about, let me just go back to inflammation. So in, we always think a lot of us who, who do integrative medicine, we describe inflammation like a cup of water. When the cup is overflowing, that's when we have symptoms. And I think thinking about runny nose is an easy way to think of that. So what we do together is we, we look at the five main triggers of inflammation and we gradually decrease that cup of inflammation. So we've all got our underlying genetics and then those five triggers are food, environmental allergies, environmental toxins, infectious diseases, and stress. Stress can be physical, it can be emotional, and they all can contribute equally to inflammation and illness. And, you know, I, I think especially in our culture, we tend to downplay how much stress profoundly impacts our health. And it's really important, especially with kids. If you have a kiddo who is in a household where there is a lot of stress and maybe it can be anything from, you know, just maybe mom and dad, you know, working through an issue or, you know, maybe one of the parents travels all during the week and the other is pretty much a single parent all during the week, or maybe it's a single family household. And it's not, it's not that we eliminate all the stress in our lives. That's never going to happen. It's about building your toolbox up of how we manage stress. And what I will tell families is we can be on perfect supplements, perfect nutrition, but if there's an under a, a big stressor, we're, we're, we're not going to be absorbing. We're going to be making very expensive urine and stool because any supplements we're putting in are not going to get absorbed. So it's always first thing is take a look at the family dynamics of what's going on and work with that while you're implementing some of these other things. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so when you start working with a kiddo and talking to his parents about implementing some of these changes, what are the most common or the most difficult challenges to overcome since kids can easily get overwhelmed? Well, it's pretty cool because when I first started doing this, I, because, you know, we always start with food most of the time and food one, we're, we're going to start with the junk food in my practice. I'm able to go deeper than that because usually people have cut out the artificial dyes and colors and a lot of the, the refined sugars and, and some of the packaged snacks. So we would go right to dairy and be, early on in my career, I spent most of the time educating families on how the kids are going to have healthy bones and that they can still be healthy without drinking milk. And now it's so the, the, the research and the education has become more widespread and it's kind of the sexy thing to read about now. It's right. It's how to be healthy. So now I get to just spend a lot more time kind of helping them through. And we have a health coach who works in our practice of how are we actually going to do this, right? Can we implement a smoothie in the morning? And can we, where are we going to get more fruits and vegetables? And that's what, if, if we could boil it down to anything, it's most kids need more fruits and vegetables. I mean, it's, the stats are staggering about it's like 65% of kids don't get the adequate amounts of fruits per day. And it's even higher than that for the getting the amount of vegetables a day. 
So we have uh, stress in a number of forms. We have toxicity. Uh, we have uh, uh, food that is depleted of vitamins and minerals and replete with toxicants. But uh, what would you say out of those things is the most difficult to overcome for someone in adolescence? Someone in adolescence? Mm -hmm. That is where I, I think the food is super challenging. And what I always talk about is if stress is one of the triggers of inflammation, if shifting the diet too much is going to create stress, that's not the time to do that. We do the best the best we can, especially at home, because we know they're going to go out with their friends and they're going to, you know, we've got no control what they're going to do. But if we are just modeling what we want them to do and then just having the food at home that's available for them, I think that's the best that you can do. And we also want to teach kids autonomy and we want them to start making their own choices. And when they, in my experience, as they start to feel better and better, they will continue to make those choices. I mean, we have little ones who will say, mm, I can't eat that, it makes my belly hurt. So it's, it, right, it's that combination of, as I always like to say, gently making them feel that it's their choice. And I, oh, none of us like to be told what to do. So I talk directly to the kids and we enlist them, you know, depending upon their age. And we really enlist them and we say, hey, this is what I'd like you to do. And this is why. When would you like to do it? Do you want to do it after your birthday? Maybe we'll do it after Halloween, after, you know, after a holiday. So we want to pick a time to set them up for success. But within those parameters, we're going to give them choices while, right, heading them down the, down the right path. Absolutely. Can you talk about um, your level of concern in terms of the amount of screen time kids are experiencing? Like I have some neighbors down the street and whenever I see them in the neighborhood, you know, they can't stop and talk to me without their son wanting the phone. Like he needs to have a constant video playing or a game to play. I mean, he can't just sit and listen. Does that concern you at all? Yes. And what I would say is model what you want your kids to do. I mean, and I have done it with my nieces and nephews. I will be on my phone telling them to put their phones away. And we have, we've had a lot of laughs over this. And what, one way to do this is we've got to make whatever else we want them to do more fun or being in activities, right? If they're on the soccer field, if they're playing the flute, if they're swimming, when they're engaged and their minds are engaged, they're not going to be on their phones. And right, being on the phone, it's a huge dopamine hit. Right. So we've got to get them a better source of dopamine, which is what, that's our feel good neurotransmitter. It helps us also think and do our homework. But what we're doing is we're bombarding our brains all day long with this dopamine and it's hard to put them down. So the it's it's a it's a challenge and it's I would first challenge the adults at home to do it so that then we can help structure that for the kids. Yeah, I was just at the gym last night and I see people on various machines texting while they're doing a set of whatever exercise. And so if we can't model it, you know, it's not really fair to ask kiddos, young ones to do it if we're unwilling to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and just can, can we get outside, get outside, get barefooted, just do the things, the things that, that make us feel good. Is there, I don't know nationally if this is the case, but are there any initiatives to sort of get kids healthier lunches? more time in nature, sort of uh, intervening, because, you know, not everyone's going to have a parent to plant that seed. So do you know of any programs like that? You know, I'm sure there are. I'm not intimately aware of national programs that are doing that, but there are things, right? Michelle Obama 
does her does the movement in getting kids physically active and i know there are initiatives i was in one a couple that used to be in my practice they have started something in north carolina that they're doing this and i just i don't know the names of all of them off the top of my head, but there are definitely, definitely programs. You know, if you just Google, you know, less screen time, if you Google, if you get on your phone and Google this. <laughs> yeah, so um, the book that you wrote that came out in September of 2021, uh, it talks about your seven steps to healthy kids, happy moms, or happy kids, happy moms. Uh, program that leads to long-lasting improvements for the kids. Can you talk about that seven-step process? Yeah. What I, I had started doing this years ago, far before I realized how I was doing it. And it's always about going through the process. And we've got to set, we've got to set the foundation before we can start doing more of the correction. And I know you know this, we, we practice in a very similar way. And it's always about, look like the first thing that we do, right, is we, we look at an assessment and where are we? Think about this the same way that you're, the same way that you plan for a trip, right? Is your You've got to know where you are, where are your GPS coordinates before we know where we're going. So we want to look at where we are. And in my book, I do, it's called, I call it the symptom tracker, the Healthy Kids Happy Mom Symptom Tracker. And I just had a family today that we, she said, you know, I filled that out. We're in probably month four of seeing this family. She said, I filled it out when we started together. And it was the number, I think she said it was like 36 out of 56 and now it's 12 out of 56 wow. and it's it, because it's also and she didn't she hadn't realized how many improvements which is why we always need to be looking and actually writing this stuff down so anyway we want to complete an assessment and then we want to identify the inflammatory illnesses what you know what do they have is it recurrent ear infections is it belly pain how often are they having bowel movements? A lot of times kids aren't even pooping every day and parents don't realize it. Um, and then we're gonna identify what their specific triggers of inflammation are. And this is why it's so important to really look at your child and your family in as they're each unique selves. And then we're gonna look at the decreasing the factors that harm gut health and then we're going to do what, what I call it's the five R's of gut healing, which is just about removing the things that we need to, replacing what we need to, repairing. And then we've got, I call it the five R's of gut healing using supplements. So we use food, then we use supplements, and then it's creating the long-term roadmap is the seventh step. And it's always, I'm thinking about these kids when they are going to college, when they're ready, if and when they want to have a family that's I want their systems to work properly and so it starts with setting this foundation absolutely so I'm sure your patients are very appreciative of the changes that they see and I know it's hard on kids to make those changes but like you mentioned their bodies are so resilient their mitochondria work better everything works better and so overall they're just gonna you know get healthier quicker so one thing I want to ask you is, you know, you've been practicing for a while. What would you say one or two things are that you know today, but you wish you would have known right out of residency? This whole concept of leaky gut, systemic inflammation, and how everything is so connected. I mean, I can remember convincing families that Miralax, Miralax is a laxative that we use for constipation. And I would prescribe it for one, two years, but I, I never stopped to, I mean, I eventually did, but I wasn't stopping to say, well, why am I having to give this child a laxative in order to have a bowel movement? Because we weren't, as shocking as it sounds, we get very little nutrition training in 
medical schools. It's starting to shift a little bit. It's not not a ton yet, but we I, I didn't know the stats with dairy, right? There's a study with dairy and constipation and they took two, a, a group of kids, right? Split them into two. So these kids were having bowel movements some some of them once every two weeks and all they did was remove dairy you know from one of the groups and within a week those kids were having daily 65 percent of the kids were having daily easy bowel movements and when they added the dairy back in within a week all of those 65 percent of those kids were constipated again so that's a right that's a well-designed study and there was a control group and that just, I stumbled upon all of these things, as did you, as did so many of us who are in this now. It's now residents and students in the healthcare profession have the ability to start to learn these things earlier on, much earlier than we did. And it's, so I, I, I wish I had understood those concepts early on, but in the same regard, I, I I love medicine. I mean, I didn't, if you had told me I would be sitting here doing a podcast on nutrition and inflammation, I would have told you you were crazy. It's just, right, the mother of necessity forced me into things because I'm not going to keep doing the same thing over and over if it's not working. Yes, we're going to use an antibiotic for the ear infections, but if you're coming back every other month with an ear infection, I'm going to ask myself what else is happening and how can we shift this? Yeah, it's crazy with the ear infection. So when I was an undergrad at Wake Forest, which is a top 25 medical school, I saw the head of the ENT department and he was prescribing powerful, powerful antibiotics for quinolones, for otitis media. And basically, you know, because my ear canals don't angle down quite as much. Once I finally found someone who thought outside of the box, he just has me blow dry my ears a little bit when I get out of the shower. Haven't needed antibiotics in over 12, 13 years. So it, 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 yeah, it's 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 remarkable when you actually put some common sense and really looking at the function of how our bodies respond to things and how our bodies are supposed to, how our bodies are supposed to function. Can you touch on the importance of breastfeeding, skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact between mother and baby? And I know not all moms are able to breastfeed, but what are some options, you know, if they're concerned about their child's gut health and immune system? What are some options for those moms? Yeah, so what Tim is talking about is we have a very high cesarean section rate in this country, up to 30% in some areas. And if you are a C-section, so the natural way of having a baby starts to seed the gut with the beneficial bacteria, which plays a profound role in our overall health. And if you're, if the baby, when the baby's going through the birth canal, they're starting to ingest the good, healthy bacteria. And then you do breastfeeding and that's so going to the birth canal, we get the lactobacillus type bacteria. Breastfeeding, we get the bifidobacteria. And then when you have skin to skin contact, you're also getting that from mom and dad. And the, the thing that we're, what you were talking about earlier about having getting yourself as healthy as possible before having the baby, because the, all of that plays a role in the baby's health. And so the, and the last thing I want, nobody can leave this podcast feeling more guilty or worried. What you did is great. You're, you've, you've got your baby and see, I, I love that we have the ability to do C-sections in this country because then we have a, right. We have a baby that Maybe in another country wouldn't have made it. So there's no guilt about anything. I was a C-section baby. Well, there you go. And look at this kid as bright as anything. <laughs> so we want, we, we're going to do all of those things. And then we're simply going to, if the baby was a C-section and maybe they need to be bottle fed is we're just going to start a probiotic 
and we're going to get outside. You ingest bacteria from being outside. We're going to garden. We're going to eat food that is maybe a little bit dirty. You know, if we have our own garden, you're going to eat, you're going to maybe rinse it a little bit, but then you're going to eat the food that way. So we're going to support the gut microbiome all the different ways that we can. And we're going to, when the baby's old enough, we're going to feed pre- biotic food. So these are fibers. This is fruits, vegetables, chia seed, flax seed, hemp seed, right? Garlic, onions. These are the things that are going to help promote the growth of the good bacteria. Absolutely. And so I read a paper probably two years ago that said, if a child is born via C-section, you know, you have basically between that time and age two to optimize the microbiome and you can do it after that, but it's much easier before that. Have you seen anything along those lines? What I, I don't do primary care any longer, but when I was doing it, it, it before I knew all of the studies is just if we had a C-section baby, we were starting a probiotic immediately. And then we were also, the minute I saw any signs of inflammation, we removed dairy. If mom was breastfeeding, we removed it from, from mom's diet. And then we did right probiotic digestive enzyme. And then we're, we're making sure also that mom is getting adequate omega-3 fats. So it's, we're looking at the whole function because we can only, you know, we've got some limitations with, with what we, we just have to take each situation as it is. So doing all of the, making all of those small changes impact the overall, the overall microbiome. And absolutely we know, right? Brain development, growth, gut health, all of that gets seeded very early on. Absolutely. Uh, since we're all stressed, uh, not just adults, but kids, is there a easy or simple way, I should say, to introduce mindfulness to kids once they're say nine, 10, 11? I would never start until that age. I would do it immediately. And this is, goes back to making sure that we're practicing what we're preaching. And so there's a term called resonance. And this means that the, per, and I know you know this, Tim, this, it's the, the little beings around us are impacted by what's going on with our nervous system. So if the kids are misbehaving or they're going bonkers, do your own systems check. Am I tired? Am I irritated? Am I mad at somebody at work? If the answer is yes, take yourself away from the kids if you can safely. And you want to do your, you know, do some deep breathing get things set and then go back to the kids. And if they're still off the charts, then they, it's, it's of them and it's not them responding to something within you. So the first way that we can start to teach mindfulness is by doing it ourselves. And then the second thing is you just do this with the kids. Kids do this so easily. I teach them alternate nasal breathing. I have some ridiculously comical videos on YouTube of just showing how to, you know, how to, how to breathe in and out of your nose, just deep breaths in and out. You can do this with blowing up balloons. You can blow bubbles, the breath, right? If we extend our exhalation a little bit longer than the inhalation that triggers our parasympathetic nervous system or our relaxation. And that also triggers the healing response. There's a lot of research out of Harvard that talks about this, right? And what we know is we can think ourselves sick or we can think ourselves healthy, right? The placebo and the nocebo effect. So mindfulness, and it doesn't always have to be, right? Sitting in a pose, meditating for 20 minutes. It's just simply remembering your breath, even setting an alarm to say, oh, like even now that I just did that, I realize I think I've been holding my breath. So just breathing. Yeah. I think, I mean, and this is kind of a reoccurring theme or motif, but we've normalized pathology to the point where we got to stop with normalizing the amount of stress that we have 
you know, the amount of inflammation that we have, the lack of sleep that we have. Would you agree? A hundred percent. We have absolutely normalized, we've normalized kids being on two and three courses of antibiotics each year. We're on, right, we use, in the U.S., we use 65% of the world's prescription medications, yet we only make up 5% of the world's population. And it's, you know, you look at most Americans and we kind of have this, this bloated look and it's, um, and it's also because I always want to be careful is we, we want to have fun too, right? You want to live your life. You don't want to, I mean, my mother is famous for saying, you know, like, Marsha, you would feel so much better if you were gluten-free and she has been gluten-free and she did feel better, but she's just like, my life is, you know, she's 83. My life is not worth living without sourdough bread. So for her, she's right. She, that's her trade-off. Um, you know, a little more inflammation. She would kill me if she knew I were saying this, but, um, so it's, it's doing that trade-off. And what I have also found is the more fun I'm having in the lower my stress is the, the more lenient I can be with what I eat. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, right. So, and I'm also a big, I do a cold plunge every day, which, you know, most of the population is not going to do, but I am 100% addicted to these cold plunges and I'm a freezing person. That's I, what we could do. Podcast. Yeah. Did you buy one of the, cause I was having this conversation of comparing the cryotherapy tanks, you know, the ones that are 50 to a hundred thousand that you can pay a couple hundred a month and go in um, to an actual cold plunge. Did you purchase a tub and put it outside or? Yeah. So during the pandemic, I moved out to a friend of mine has this great little lake cottage um, out, out in here in Charlotte. And I started doing it in the lake. It was like February and I thought I needed to do something. And so I started doing it in the lake and then right summertime comes in Charlotte and it's, you know, the lakes are a million degrees. And so I started, so anyway, I got a cold plunge. Yep. I got one of those. It's called the plunge tub and it's, oh my gosh, I love it. And the, 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 the amazing ladies that I work with, you know, if I'm being a little bit off and like, you didn't jump in the lake today, did you? Or you didn't go, you didn't plunge today, did you? And that, that's a huge, that's a big dopamine hit. And they yeah. say it's, it's, well, I won't get into exactly what they say about it. I've got to plug my computer in here. Um, so anyway, that's right. You've got to find what works for you, right? For me, it's yoga, it's plank chopping, it's pickleball, horseback riding. It's, you know, and it's being outside. I start to get jittery if I don't get outside enough. Absolutely. So if someone wants to connect with you, possibly work with you, where should they go? Yep. So it, the, my website is sheilakilbane.com. It's just S-H-E-I-L-A-K-I-L-B-A-N-E.com. And then we have, you know, three main ways that we can work with people is we have our in-person, our brick and mortar practice. We have our online course, Seven Steps to Healthy Kids, Happy Moms. And then my book, Healthy Kids, Happy Moms, which is sold anywhere books are found. And, you know, if people feel like they need the personal touch of coming in person, we have an incredible team and you can, you can sign up for just a, a, a phone call with our amazing patient care coordinator. And she'll kind of talk you through what that process looks like. And if it, if, if families may be a good fit for our practice. Awesome. Well, we'll put all your links in. You've been a wealth of information. Thanks for the work that you're doing. And hopefully we can have you back on again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. All right. Thank you.